Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. Eric Lederman from Late Night with Seth Meyers. Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Bart. Appreciate it. Yeah, man, this is really cool. Um, you are the man behind the rotating drummer, I guess I'll call it program, at Seth Meyers, and uh, it is just I think it has done so much stuff for our community that it, it has just brought so many drummers up and give them an opportunity to perform on TV. It's it's super cool. So I'm excited to hear about it today. Awesome. I'm excited, I'm excited to be here. I love the I love the podcast. And I, I guiltily admit that I get most of my information about the podcast from Instagram. But yep. everything I get, I just love. Uh, you're covering a wide variety of diverse topics in the drum world from history, true history, um, all the way, you know, past and, and present and future. So congrats on that and maintaining an actually interesting drummer podcast. Cheers to you. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, I kind of uh, I hook people with Instagram and then I, I pull them in and then I get them with the podcast episodes. But uh, let's hop in and start with how did you get the job in 2013 working on late night? Well, I, um, I was living in L.A. and since about 2000, I've been a freelance comedy writer and producer. So my, you know, I've always hustled as a freelance, a freelancer in that world since college. And that's, that's my main, you know, profession. Um, and at night for all those years, like I lived in New York for like two or three years after college and I did LA for about 12 before I moved to New York, um, when late night kicked off and launched in December, 2013. But, um, all those years freelancing, hustling, for TV, I was also at night, you know, four or five nights a week going down to my lockout um, in LA, downtown LA, and working on my own bands. And um, I toured professionally as a drummer for a couple of years in that in that time, um, and did my own bands as well. Um, so I was always trying to, you know, have my, you know, dip my toe in two worlds, and sure. waiting for one to pop, you know, was always my thing. But the reality was, I knew it was probably going to end up being TV. Not just because my uh, skills and abilities as, as a drummer were pretty limited, just to being um, a rock basher, but I knew that you know, as a as a television producer, that that was that was going to be not only more lucrative, but also like more rewarding and, and quite honestly more likely to happen. And that's exactly what happened. Um, but of course, with this this kind of role, um, I had the flexibility and the creative kind of leeway to create this program, so my worlds kind of converged under one roof, which I think is one of the most, the best success stories for a, a niche television producer slash drummer ever. <laughs> and only one probably. Yeah. But I mean, it goes down in like infamy of like, first off the late night show in general is kind of like hallowed ground, but Fred Armisen is involved. He's obviously the leader of the band. Correct. Correct. All That's right. Correct. So then the reason it started, and then I'll let you take it away, though, is from what I have read, and it seems pretty obvious because Fred is a pretty busy guy, is he started on guitar, mm -hmm. switched to drums, and then his busy schedule made it so he couldn't be there all the time. Is that kind of fair you to say? Are, you're getting your info from a legit source. This is no page six. <laughs> you're coming, and I'm, I'm going to verify it you know, right from the legitimacy of, of, of my... Uh, my occupation to tell you you are correct all these things are Good, correct okay. so fred cool. basically in 20 or uh late 2013 before the show launched in early 2014 the show was originally going to have a dj and then lauren michaels came up with the idea you know and I said hey how, how about fred armison you know we get him to lead the band and he forms the band so as i was brought in to not do any of those things really i was brought in to co-run the show under um the showrunner. Um, so that's a pretty, you know, for me to move to LA for this job, you know, was what I've been gunning for to work network, to work at 30 rock, could you come back to New York was like, really like, okay, I've, this is, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And this is a big job. And I was very grateful and I'd worked hard to get there. So when I got there though, I was like, Oh, a DJ. And I was I'm like, Oh, well, we could have a band. Like we could have like, I didn't even think about that. That was going to be my thing. And and my showrunner said to me, he's like, well, you should probably handle this because, you know, he was dealing more with the writing and the, and Seth and the, and the creative. And I was there to kind of keep every, all the trains running, but as like, a, you know, in the managerial role, but like more as a creative producer. And that means sure. different things for different shows. But for this show, it meant clearly, you know, managing and helping Fred put together the band. So 
Fred brought in like a couple guys that he really you know had known over the years and wanted. Sid, um, Sid Butler on bass, Seth Jabor on guitar, Eli Janney on keys, and kind of the associate MD who runs things, you know, with tracks and organizing the band um, from a musical standpoint. Um, and he keeps everything running, you know, internally with them. And I kind of oversee the whole band. But um, long story short, we had just a couple of weeks to put the band together. We had Kim Thompson on drums, great player. And Fred, yes, correct, was always playing guitar. Um, and as the kind of, you know, the weeks and months roll by and the show evolved, fr- um, Kim left. Fred is like, well, I'm going to play drums. Like, you know, I'm a drummer first. Um, sure. and we all yep. know Fred's, Fred is an inspiration to people like me. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever said this to you or any listeners have heard this where it's like, well, you can only do this thing. And everyone wants to label you and put you as like, you're a this. And you can't be that. You have to just stay in this lane. So Fred is band leader. Fred is on drums. And as correctly, Fred has crazy schedule stuff. So he's doing TV shows. He had Portlandia at the time. That was this like full-time gig. Yeah. Um, and then he was doing cameos and movies and his own stand-up sets and touring and then music stuff on the side. So basically we would have like, you know, a local, this guy, Matt Schultz would come in and kind of do it. And then I sort of looked at, well, Fred's not here. Like, why don't we just aim high and I'm going to call players. I'm going to aim high and call for like the best players I know. And then players that I met from touring, you know, over the years as well. And people, I, even if I didn't tour with them, I kind of, you know, I knew them from Nam or just met them randomly through being in bands in Los Angeles. So that's really how it started. And Fred was, I think at first he was like, huh. And then it's when he saw it happening, he picked up pretty quickly that like, this is a great thing because, you know, it's his band and I want to make sure he was comfortable. And we're going to be swapping out the drummer every week with a new heartbeat, as I say all the time. And the band was new. And then on top of the band being new and, and not used to being on national television and me being in this role, you know, we were all, the show was new for everyone. I had been in TV forever, but I was basically like managing this band and then giving them a new drum every week. And so they had to adapt. There was a lot of adaptation, you know, going on and figuring out how we bring the drummer and where we put them up. If we fly them in, if we get them a car, how we get them the tracks, is it in-ears, how the cues happen, what their day is like, what the schedule is like. I mean, I could bore everyone to pieces about, you know, now it's easier said than done, but at the time it was wild. And each sure. week I, I would have the band, the drummer come in and like play, I'm like, oh, what band do you in? I remember John Stanier was there from Helmet. And I'm like, oh yeah, well, what's your cover? And then each week I'd ask the drummer, it's like, pick a cover or two that you'd want to do. Um, and then I'll have the band learn it. So then I had the band like learning covers, you know, and not usually with vocals. So it was like instrumental, you know, tracks just for the nerds who's like, who followed the drummers yeah. from these bands. Be like, hey, were they just Week playing, after week you know? after week. Yes. Yeah. Hey, yeah. like I think I think they did. Um, did we do like Tommy the Cat with like um, Tim Alexander? I mean, we might I, have. Yeah, I think I, I remember seeing that one. I love Tim. I love Herb. I love Primus. <laughs> yeah, I was like, t- like Tim's gonna do this one, and then just, I remember Sid being like, "So I'm gonna play the the bass line that Les Claypool wrote." I'm like, "Yeah, figure <laughs> yeah. it out." Yeah, you can do that. Okay, see you later. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, I don't have to do it. So they did, the band deserves a lot of credit for figuring all that out. And Fred deserves a lot of credit yeah. for trusting me to do this because it was a, all a bit of a giant experiment. And Seth and um, my showrunner, Mike Shoemaker, they were like, yeah, do it. You know, they trusted me to do it and they trust me to this day to do it. So it was a bit of it's one of those things like when I was younger, I'm like, oh, yeah, let's do this. And, you know, it was it was wild. And then yeah. we promote their their wares every night. It was a it was a wild first couple of years, but yeah, that's, that's basically totally. the gist of how it came to be. Yeah. And I mean, I, I didn't think about this at all because sometimes with, uh, you know, celebrities like Fred Armisen, you, you don't think of their feelings sometimes, you know what I mean? Cause you're just like, you're a huge celebrity, but it really is a little bit of like any drummer who has another drummer filling in. You kind of think like, you're a little like, Oh, you know, geez, that's my gig, but it takes a lot of maturity for him. Yes. Uh, to kind of just be cool with that, which he, he, he is who he is, which, you know, he's on another level of, you know, he's very famous and all that stuff, but it's really cool that he's okay with it and encourages it because it's, take it's a the, great Take thing. the celebrity out of it, you know, like take the celebrity out of it and put the drummer into it. Like we all know totally. uh, when I, what, so I played with, when I played professionally, Scott Ian 
of you know legendary metaller from Anthrax and and a wonderful guy and his wife Pearl. Just the two of them are some of the best you know two of the best people I know. We've had a long relationship, a long friendship, and they gave me my break back in like um oh oh seven. Saw me playing like with my solo band at uh, the Roxy, and they came to see me, and then they wanted me to audition for Pearl's band, and that's who I. I end up mm-hmm. getting the gig, but like, God bless, you know, just the idea of, of, uh, you know, being out in public and someone being like, Oh, yeah, there's my break. And it's like, then after I wasn't playing in the band anymore for two and a half, three years later, and I was like doing TV more seriously, cause I had to sort of make a choice. We had a bit of a rupture there for a minute. And then I saw, um, I forget what his name from Fall Out Boy, wonderful player. What's his name? Andy, um, is it Ta- Andy? tons of tattoos. Andy. Yes. The Ripper. Yeah. He's awesome. He played with them for a minute. And my long winded point is that like, whenever someone takes your spot, even if it's on good terms, not good term, whatever it is, like there's a little bit of ego bruise there. And it could be for your shitty bar band that no one knows about. You know what I mean? But there is a real, so forget the celebrity part and let's just get to the, like the drummer part of like, Oh, you took my gig. You know, that's, that's musicians, right? But Fred, like explaining to him like what the need was and really like communicating with him um, and, and under working with talent for a while, like he's, he's a reasonable human being and he also understood what I was trying to do. And he deserves really all that credit for letting me roll with this. Yeah. And he's like, oh, how cool I mean, that we had this yeah. person and that person. Like, so it was just the yeah. best. The alternative would be a, I don't want to say a faceless drummer, but you would just get someone who's a really solid session or maybe a Broadway drummer have them come in and kind of just play the gig, not get much attention, but instead you turned it into something where I honestly think in, in our community, which isn't giant, but it, it it's a draw to watch the show, especially mm-hmm. for people where it's like, I just want to check out and see, oh man, I love that band. Let me see their drummer. Uh, it's, a, it's a new reason, not that you need another reason to watch the show, but it's a new reason to tune in. It's something always new. It's, it's new interactions and... Uh, I mean, you are making, uh, from what I've seen, a lot of the guys, you know, you see on social media and they post the videos throughout the week and and photos Mm -hmm. of their time there. I mean, like you were making dreams come true. Like really it, the level of what it means to people is so huge. Uh, and I love to see that people's fun posts from the week. That's very nice. And, and, you know, usually I try to take whoever comes in for the week out for a meal. If the week allows, like sometimes it gets so hectic with doing the other parts of my job and this this part is kind of ballooned into something else um like sometimes i can't like make even the rehearsal for the day but i know if the drummer is competent after you know like monday tuesday i know that if something else comes up that i if i if i have to miss rehearsal i can but it mm-hmm. is a lovely thing you know to see a competent player come in and also be competent doing this because you have a lot of players who come in and there are millions of dollars in the bank, Grammy nominated, or just known as like session cats, highly respected in the community. It's a completely new skill set that they're trying to crush in a, in literally a yeah. moment. They have, a, uh, you know, the morning rehearsal and then the studio rehearsal, and then they have to be on national television and they really can't make any mistakes. And if they do, like sometimes I can clean them up and edit and sometimes I can't, but when they're done, you know, they're, ex- they're, uh, most of them are exasperated and exhilarated and kind of like, oh, like it's a mix yeah. of those two things. And they're just like, thanks so much for having me. And I forget that sometimes in doing this for as long as I've been doing it. And the band too, I think they'd agree. Like it's a lovely opportunity that it's really my pleasure to be able to do. And I kind of can't believe that, you know, of all the things, you know, when we were all young ones, you know, to be able to sit behind and watch Jimmy Chamberlain play and hang out with him and Matt Cameron and Bron Daler and, you know, John Theodore. I mean, I can't, you know, it's like I had Terry Lynn Carrington, you know, I had Cal yeah. Utah. I mean like, yeah. And then I, I have to give them notes, you know, sometimes and like, that's weird. <laughs> but like, yeah. you know, now I've also, I've gotten over that hump too of like, Oh yeah, this is my thing. And they have to do it my way because my way is the show's way. And yeah they have to fit into a system that works for the band and the show and me and Seth and all those things. And it's some people don't get that quickly, but when they do and then they get it right and they are very grateful for the guidance more times, way many more times than not. And I think just the whole experience for them, it crystallizes and like, you know, wow, this has been an amazing week. And so 
I think that's with anything though, right? You have to like, you're doing your job. Hey, I'm so psyched to be on the podcast. It's an honor. It's like, yeah, but like, and you're like, yeah, it's cool. It's my, but like we we are elevating drummers and musicians to a stage where they might not have ever thought they could be. And I try not to lose sight of that week after week for sure. Absolutely. And there's sometimes mine is different where uh, mine are more, let's say guys or girls who are uh, some of the guests will be like older and they'll have these stories that are literally only in their brain. And actually it just, it just happened recently not to make it into a downer, but a uh, guest old guest on the show, Ron Weinstein, who was on, who uh, did it. He it was the inventor of tuxedo bags and he had an amazing episode wow. with, um, with Louis Belson was like the one who helped him start Ron recently passed away very suddenly. And it made me mm-hmm. think at, at 64 or something, which is terrible, but it made me think how glad I am to have that story preserved in an audio platform where people can go back and listen to it. And I think archiving, it's archiving. Absolutely. Archiving. It's it's different though with it's similar but different. But like people can, you know, in 20 years go back and watch their their week on the show and just take that with them forever. And I think it's it's just incredible um to be able to share that. People are having the time of their life when they do it. I mean it's they are. It's, <laughs> you see their face they are. I'm like, oh my God, you're having so much fun. Uh, but you know, not on my, not, not, I don't think anyone ever has fun on Monday. Monday is the first day where everyone is collectively, you know, tightening their sphincters when they're sitting on, (laughs) on the, on the throne because they're like, Oh, it's real. Even like, you know, a lot of local players, I say, if I don't know them or I haven't been actively pursuing them, because people hit me up on Instagram and uh, admittedly, I have so many people who like, I can't book or like, I just, I'm so from, from the pandemic, I'm years behind. And like people I want to book and I still owe people weeks. Oh, you know, yeah. technically, but like oh, I, things I know happen yeah. and everyone there, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who feel, uh, I haven't seen them or I said, I would like, you know, check them out. But like, I, I also have like let go a little bit and I'm like, listen, I'm, I will get to everyone. It's also nice to have repeat customers come in. Who I know are going to do great. Like if we have four yeah. weeks in a row of like new players, that's a lot for me, for, um, my production staff, Um, and for the band, you know, and that creates a lot of agita because it's all good in those first two rehearsals. Like, Oh, they're great. And then they come out and then 200 people are sitting there. Seth comes out and then they have to nail these cues. They have to like, not look like they're lost or scared. And once they get through that Monday show and relatively unscathed, which most people do like, you know, a hiccup here or there, then, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they really start to enjoy themselves and they don't want to leave. Like this is the best week. Especially if they're a drummer who hasn't gotten like their due or isn't yes. like the central focus of, of their band or in the drum world or they're a pit player or they're, you know, whatever it is, it's about them as much as it can be yeah. about an individual on the show that's about someone else and this collective idea of Seth's late night show. Um, totally. But he's their Seth, name being announced. It's that's a big right. Deal. But Seth yeah. says their name every night, which I think is the coolest. I remember bringing that to him. I'm like, so every night we got to intro these guys. There are guests and like, no, there was never, these weren't like, the truth is there weren't like me negotiating or being like, Hey, we should really talk about the drummer every night. He's like, great idea. Yep. You will. Yep. We'll do that. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's been simple. And I am very, again, grateful for that. Cause that could have been a hurdle too, where it's like, we don't acknowledge like these amazing players, but we do. And, um, the band is there to support them every night as well. So everyone, it's a giant group effort in every regard to make that exhilarated drummer stoked to be there every week and every (laughs) night. You kind of took, you know, uh, you, you, you answered one of my questions before I asked is what does Seth think of the rotating drummer program? Sounds like he thinks it's awesome. You know, is he a musician? He is not. Seth is not a musician. He fully supports the program. I, you know, the, my insecurity is one day he's going to be like, oh, we shouldn't do it. You know, that's that's everyone's kind of fear, I think, ever. It's just like, oh, this ride is going to end. But he really understands um, the artistic aspect of this. And he doesn't have to be a musician to get it. And to me, it's just like that signals to me that he understands what I'm doing and understands how important it is for artists and musicians to have a voice. And his his specialty is you know he's an improv you know Im, you know amazing improver from back in the day and oh, he's yeah. just an excellent writer great foil i mean all of the snl stuff like he supported and lifted up other people his whole career and he does that yeah. with guests 
the great, I mean, I think he's, he, I still think he's the best interviewer on late night. And because he really, people, he listens to people and he may, wants them to do great on the show. There's no, yeah. and he's not trying to make himself look great or get a better joke in them. He supports and elevates everyone he's around um, on the show. And he does, and by in, and announcing the drum every night, he's continuing that, you know, that exercise. And I think that yeah. is something that if you look at the big picture of Seth and what the show is, it makes perfect sense. And um, I just really totally. appreciate that he does that. It's really, he really comes wonderful. off as a very nice guy and like supportive of people and not like, uh, like that kind of like, I bet that guy's a jerk off camera f- feel you know, sometimes you get with people on TV and, and I thought the weekend update background was also very like, like you're queuing people up for other like you're queuing people up for success with their bits that they're going to do or absolutely segment, you know? So now I got to ask, so in your experience of doing this and you don't have to name any names or anything, but have you had any maybe early on or now, are there any like situations where something's going to go, it goes wrong with the drummer performing? There's, there's the wheels fall off kind of thing. What, what do you do in that situation? Oh, I mean, like I definitely take less chances based on my love of a player than I did back in, in the first few years, I definitely had people come in and no fault of their own. It's really more fault of mine. I take full responsibility um, of someone who comes in and they either they're in a band. They've been playing with that band for years. They play the song from start to finish, which is basically, you know, a composition here. I'm asking them to start and stop randomly whenever we go to commercial whenever we have to stop down for something and then they need to get out of that you know phrase and signal very clearly to the band where the one is Mm -hmm. and they need to do it cleanly because you know a lot of times that that um fill or that uh, that you know that part in the phrase where we have to wrap things up will be on camera and i can't really get out of it and my editor can't clean it up and um it's almost not fair to ask some players to do that um, I think the the players who know how to do that um, the best doesn't matter what genre they are, um, what kind of person they are, what their background is educationally. They're just the best listeners are the ones who succeed um, in being the best at this job. You know, on camera experience sure. is great, playing to a crowd is great, but the ones who have everything are the ones I think who listen, understand the gig because it's a gig. It's not like. A lot of people are like, oh, you were saying earlier, oh, it's the greatest week. It's all about me. It's really not. They're there to support. And I think a lot of people show up and they realize it's a gig. And if I ever have to be firm with someone and be like, you're ending your fills too quickly. You're looking like, you know, a deer in the headlights on camera. These are all normal things to expect from someone who hasn't done this before. But I yeah. definitely have to come in. And it, there's been people in the past, sure, who can't end the fill, who, again, um, aren't aware that they're on camera who aren't looking for my stage manager for the cues, who aren't aware of, like, who can't pull out of the phrase, like, well, I have to finish the phrase, or I have to finish my fill, or whatever. And I've had some of the best players in the world not be, quote, good at the late night gig. That doesn't mean that they're mm-hmm. a bad drummer. They're just not great for me. And I have players that are great, and sometimes they don't come back again for whatever reason. If, like, you know, they, didn't, they just felt like it was a check on their resume, or sure. they didn't bond with the band as much, like, there's all sorts of reasons, but like, and there's some players who I know I just can't have back again because they didn't get it. But th- those, to be fair, that happens less and less now. The truth of the matter is, and, I, and you didn't ask the question, but I'll say it. The players who haven't played with bands or people, and um, I'm all for the youth and I'm all for the Instagram players and stuff. But there's a lot of players who come in and haven't had that experience of touring, playing with bands and are playing for likes and, and comments and uh, brand sponsorships and and money from just turning the camera on themselves and they're great players they don't understand the gig that doesn't mean i'll ever stop booking those players because i think it's part of our community and culture love it or hate it or just understand that it's a mixed bag i and i'm sure you agree but it's like we got to keep investing in the use and and, um, the new technology and hopefully uh, a player comes in who didn't get it or was like a little out of their, out of their, uh, out of their own uh, head on an, out, out of the league of what the gig is that they left a better yeah. drummer. I don't know if that's been the case. I think a lot of people think they killed it from that world, <laughs> and they come in and they're like, "Yeah, like I did the Seth Myers, I got the gig," and they don't realize like, "Wow, well, I'm like, I never have that back again." Because 
they didn't get it. But I hope yeah. that I make them like a better player, and I hope I, the band inspires them to listen better because those are the best players. I think that's very well said. Where um, there's there was a debate online of uh, it, it like went it was the viral kind of like someone posted some text that was like, "Can you be a professional drummer if you're not playing actual gigs? Like if you are operating just on YouTube and you're just Hot on topic. Instagram and stuff." Hot but topic. My, my, my response to that would be if you're making money doing something, I think yes. like by definition, you are technically doing it professionally. I think that being said that there's something that's uh, it's it's less it's so debated where it's like I still think you're le- very legitimate. But like you said, once you get and put in those hot seat kind of in front of an audience situations, you may be kind of shocked. And I feel like Maybe they're going to get some opportunities that they're not quite ready for. And I'm speaking like I'm some authority, but like maybe they're given this opportunity like that because they have this great background and can shred, but they didn't climb the ranks of the the clubs and stuff. And it's it's just like, whoa, <laughs> jarring, you know, well, let's let's not let's let's the two of us not be self-deprecating about this, because the bottom line is it is important and we are an authority on it. And I don't I I'm all about adopt, as I said earlier. I will adopt the youth, embrace with, you know, big embrace, big open arms over here, um, and all about that opportunity. But it's like, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to like sh- shy away from the reality of, um, yeah, those those things are important. Those analog things, uh, touring, playing with other bands, coming into sessions and nailing it, and and having everyone love you and doing your job first and foremost. You know, like, I don't want to deal with your manager. I mean, if they're in a band, I'll deal with their manager and stuff, and that's fine. I always have to deal directly with the drummer. Phone, if I don't know them, phone call um, or very intense texting. Like with Benny Greb, I think eventually we got on like a, a WhatsApp audio call. Like, I know Benny's one of the best in the world, but like, I needed to talk to him and I want to make sure he was on the page. Um, yeah. But uh, there's, it's just like everyone has to go through the same thing and everyone. Uh, can learn from this gig and I'm never going to back down and say that like touring and gigging and session work is not essential to be a well-rounded professional. Correct. We are, if you're getting paid then you're to do something, you're a professional and you have to be professional. There is no debate yeah. on this topic is my point. There is no debate. No, you, you if you want to be a musician, like, okay, then you have to do it. Our quote, our way. If you want to just be a drummer then that's fine. But if you want to be a professional musician, you have to put in the time and the work and be diverse as you can. Because even the people who are the most successful in this world, are they millionaires? I don't think so. They are like, yeah. they are, there are very few spots, you know, to be filled. Like how many Josh Freeses are there in the world? Do you know what I mean? Who could come in and, and, sure. and play like anything rock, you know, like how many, you know, it's, it's that thing are you playing jingles and playing on soundtracks. Like those are the jobs you want. If you want to come in and just like play to a camera all day, like that's great. But like now get out of that, go on tour, like get out there, use the camera and as a, it's a tool, right? Use Instagram as a tool to get your name out there, show people your skills and then go out on the road or be a session player. Like get push into that world. It's, it's just the launch pad. Totally. And advertising, as far as I'm concerned, but let's not let's let's yeah. you and I right now end the debate to all the <laughs> listeners out there about like can they be? It's like sure, you can be whatever of you course. want, you can say you're whatever you you are, but if you'd like to be a well-rounded musician, you have to go out and you have to get you know the scars of being on the road and dealing with other people. That's that's yeah. part of it. Big deal. Big totally. deal. And, and listening. I've said a thousand. And times. listening. One thing, so you, there's so many different drummers, and you mentioned this before we started, and it's a great point, is, um, and I am very aware, aware of this myself in, in my world, you can't just book people who you like and your friends and, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, genre players who you like. Like for me, I can't just talk about things that I like. I have to get out of my comfort zone, which has bitten me sometimes because I'm talking about orchestral stuff that I have no clue about. But yeah, yeah. Uh, in your world, though, what was that process like of learning it? Because you're more of a rock metal guy, mm-hmm. but like Terry Lynn Carrington, you mentioned, like it's great to get out of your comfort zone. The legend, there's like a couple of different categories. There's like 
look, this is eight, let's let's back up. The HE band is a rock band. So when you put a jazz drummer in, you put a fusion drummer in, uh, you put a, a gospel player in, you put a pop player in. You're you're taking a. I'm always taking like a risk of a, another layer of risk, right? Because it's a rock band, and it's like you know, uh, even like a clinician, you know, type player. Like, um, I, it really, you could come in and, and you can um, you could ACDC this, you know, and and I need two and four, and I need you to speak the fills. You get the signal from our stage manager to wrap it up. Oh, cool! I always tell drummer take a breath, then glock him, glock him. Band knows exactly where you're going. Everyone knows where the one is. <laughs> Pat Boone, yeah. Debbie Boone. You know, I mean, all yeah. the stuff that we learned as kids. <laughs> like, let's all do a fill. It's like, okay, well, what's a fill that 185 people know that the song is ending, including Seth? You know, yeah. where it's like, oh, the song is about to end. Like, yeah. it's da, just do, even da, da, da. Yeah. correct. Even if people don't aren't musicians or aren't musical, they know it, and the audience knows it. And when I have a drummer who can't get the fill at the end doesn't matter what their genre of their background is. If they're a jazz expert or a rock expert, if they can't hit the one, they're no professional. They're no expert to me because they're blowing the gig. Sure. So I found, um, again, like where it's, I knew I, no one ever, there was no mandate to be clear from anyone at my job, like book diverse, book genre diverse, but I knew to do this stuff because I've been doing producing long enough to know that like, we, you in TV, you want to get as many eyeballs as you can, and the world of drums and drummers is big. And when when I came up, we all read Modern Drummer. I read about all different kinds of drummers, and I was some of them. I was like, I don't even want to try to learn this because I don't have the skill or the patience. But like, yeah. I respected them. It's like when I, I still haven't had Dennis Chambers, but like Chambers come on there, like would he kill it? I mean, I'd have to say yes, but I don't know. Because he comes from a different world. He comes from a world of a lot of notes. Um, and there's been a lot of players who come on who play a lot of notes. And some of them play too many notes. But eventually, like, I, then that's when I get up. I'm, well, yeah. And I, I'm like, hey, don't trick the band where the one is so you can do a sick fill. <laughs> yeah. Which, that's why we love, like, Vinny and these guys who are, like, mega drummers. But this really is like a... And I love how you said ACDC it because we we all know exactly what you mean. Where you're just doing just just a straight two four beat, but I mean you got to know how to play for the gig. I think that's the biggest that's kind thing. of humbling for guys like that. Yeah, know to play for the gig, but then also a lot of the fans uh, when they find out like their favorite drummer is going to be on, like oh this is going to be sick, especially the metal guys, the clinician guys, big chops guys who have that reputation of being you know quote sick drummers. You know what I mean? Who have big chops. Um, you know, Danny Carey's coming back on the show in a couple of weeks. And I'm sure it's just like, oh, man, Danny's going to play some odd time crazy. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it, it, now, as the week goes on, like maybe, you know, the drummers, I remember Thomas Lang would traded for is like on a Thursday with the band and they gave him space really to solo. But he always came back and knew where the one was. So even if like I was never like holding my breath, like. It, the fills were yeah. sick, but he came right back and the band never had to guess. And when I have drummers sure. who come on and do that, try to like trick the band, like they're like, oh, well, they, I, they need to know where I'm going. It's like, no, 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 no. You need to know where they're going and you need to speak clearly about where you are going, <laughs> you know, in conjunction with them. Yeah. You're, you're working as a unit. It's not about you. So the players who do that, they've come from all areas. They're all walks of life, all backgrounds, all different training. There is no like one kind of drummer uh, 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 that gets it better than anyone else. It's always a little bit of a crapshoot, always with a new player. And sometimes sure. I have players come back and they just weren't as good as they were the first time. Um, they get to in their head or they've sometimes like players have come in and they've had like surgeries or um they like have been like, oh, I've just been like playing this more style of music and like, oh, I sort of forgot. And I was always, I'm always like a little like, yeah, you've done it before. But, you know, drums are a mental, uh, you know, a yeah. real mental exercise. And totally, if you're in your yeah. head and you're having a you're in your head, you're having a bad day, you're more likely going to have a bad show. Um, yeah. And sometimes like if people are having bad weeks or months and I'm like, man, what happened? But um, God, there's just yeah. never been any like true disasters where. I thought like I was gonna be able to air them. You know what I mean? There's been a couple of sure, times where I've great. had to get on the kit though. 
We won't talk about oh, who that those are, but that's, <laughs> where that's you mortifying. Had to s- sit in and replace, basically. No, no, no. At just at rehearsal. Where I'm oh, like, and just like show this. them. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, the room gets it. real weird. I, I hate that more than anything, <laughs> but my job is to make sure that the band feels comfortable with whoever is driving. And if yeah. I have to, quote, embarrass a drummer or embarrass people in the room feel embarrassed, so be it. I, I don't have any time. We have a matter of hours on that Monday, you know, especially yeah. like before the show starts. And if someone's not getting it, I'm not, I can't tell them to leave. I'm like, you have to no. figure this out. Here's how to do it. And then I, my, my rusty ass gets on the kit. And then I pat Boone, Debbie Boone to remind them like, <laughs> oh, oh. But if you show them that, that with the straight two four Pat Boone, Debbie Boone, that you can do it. It's almost like here's the like I'm here's the you're drawing you know here's the outline you can color it in more but you got to stay within the the lines that you're giving them it's almost probably a little bit you know like clear to be like here is the simple form just stay at this and then you can embellish from there but that's probably you know helpful to see that you you think it is now sometimes it, I'm very clear about it and they they can't some of the players have too many chops too many tools. You know, our whole, all our lives, all these drummers, like, you got to, like, take from my tools, and these are some of the things I use. And then they forget how to just, like, strip it all down and do its best of the song. And we've been told that our whole lives, through from our teachers, you know, and, and players we look up to. You know, like, you want the gig? Play two and four. You know what I mean? Play what's yeah. right for the gig. But you've spent years developing, you know, hitting the pad and doing everything that you're supposed to be doing um, in a way I think personally, that's why I, I got a couple of gigs back in the day because I put on a great show. I, I was talking to Adam Willard about this, who's recovering from, um, he had a motorcycle accident and he's like really working very hard to wow. get back um, to 100%. And I said to him, I go, for me, I had back surgery in February and I haven't really played as, as much, I'm, but I'm just mm-hmm. starting to feel like I can go in and, and hit, hit hard. But if I, if I just could play like just to play drums without the sweat and the feeling that two and four hit every molecule of my DNA, that's why I do it. I don't do it just to like, Oh, I love drums. I'm going to sit in the corner and play quietly. That's to me, like, that's what I want. And that's what I need to feel to like be able to play drums. If I can't do it that way, it's Hmm. like not going to still be, you know, man, maybe if I'm, when I'm older, like just playing, but like it won't have the same satisfaction for, for me. Yeah. You like the pressure. Yeah, the pressure and but like also the physical. I remember, remember when a head drumsticks came out, and it's like you 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 don't get the vibration back. Like, dude, I want that vibration from wood sticks sure. to go through all of my bones. I want to <laughs> feel exhausted. I want to have to ice after the show. I want to not yeah. be able to talk to people for an hour after the show because <laughs> I'm short of breath. I think that's the way I used to play, and I white knuckled. But that's like that's what I needed. And that's, um, awesome. that, that's what works for me. But like, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's awesome, but like it's stupid, but I mean, <laughs> but a- Adam, Adam wants to get back to that stage too. I can tell like, he's like, yeah, you know, someone after a big accident would be happy to be back at 90%. And I know he wants to be back at a hundred for real where he was. Um, yeah. And, and he'll get there. Totally. But, well, and yeah, good. Uh, you know, well wishes to him. Um, I also want to mention while we're kind of on, it's similar to that topic that I think you've done a very good job of doing uh, a mix of both male and female drummers because Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, a very male heavy world. Um, I have found on social media doing what I do which you know, digging through YouTube and posting old videos. I try to post as many female drummers as I can. But, you know, if I'm posting something that's from the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, even the 40s it's mainly men. So I am very cognizant of like uh, when I can, I'll post a really great female drummer. Uh, Nowadays, there's a lot more obviously uh, displayed publicly than there were then. So I think you have done a great job of that. Has that been something in your mind of trying to do a balance of, you know, keeping it fair on both sides? Absolutely. And that's another thing I was saying earlier. It's just a common sense thing to me. I think a lot of people get caught up in like, think it's political correctness or wokeness or something that they think, um, oh, being diverse. And I think that word and that action has sort of been polluted a little bit and really misconstrued. I don't, I I have women on just like I have um, multiple different genres on and and people uh, that aren't just like white rock guys, because there's nothing wrong with white rock guys. 
There just needs to be every everybody. There Agreed, needs to be everybody yeah. because drums of all the instruments, what is more primal, what is more human than the drum? You know what I mean? Like what is more universal, a more universal instrument that anyone can do? The drum. You know what I mean? Besides like your voice as an instrument, you know, like the drum. And to me, it's just common sense. And I think if more people use that common sense about things like, well, why should it be? It's just like, I'm not, I'm not a kumbaya person. And I don't think everyone should just, oh, it's like all like, you know, peace, peace pot, man, you know, like we're all one, right? <laughs> but like we are, and you can do that without any sort of, um, it doesn't have to be a, a label and it doesn't have to be um, uh, like an attitude or the way that I define myself or the show. I book drummers and if I booked a similar kind of drummer every week, it would be boring and totally. it would be a yeah, challenge really. for the band. And it's just about being human. And it's like one of those things, like I think a lot of people who are disgruntled or hit me up, it's like, Oh, well, like you're not going to book me cause I'm this or this kind of drummer and this kind of person. And I think a lot of people don't say those things, but I think they're seeing it. And it's like, yeah, you're right. I'm not going to go like all these weeks and like not have a woman on because we're not representing properly human beings and, and human beings play drums. And, um, it's just like, it's one of those things I get a little, I'm confused why anyone would, you know, um, think that it would be, there's another way to do it because there's yeah. not. And that has been something that is a giant omission over the years that men do where it's just like, the idea that like men are better at sports and only men can do it. It's like, it's, it's just a hacky bit to me where it's like, Oh no, I'm bet. It's just like, okay, if that's what you think, but I'm going to book everyone. You know, I try to mix it up week to week too. You know, I have a lot of like metal guys, like in general that I've, um, and rock guys that just have kind of been building up a little bit just because it's weird touring and pandemic schedules and stuff and trying to coordinate all these people um, who I know the best and are the most connected to, I still space them out with people I know less about because that's what's best for drums. And that's what's best for totally. the community. Whether the community, I don't need any pat on the back from the community. I appreciate it when people notice. Um, that's a nice feeling, but this is, I'm doing it for what I think is the correct way to do it, which is everyone should have a seat at the table when it comes to drums. And that's not up for debate yeah. for me. Yeah, because it's like it's the the Ringo moment where the little kid sitting there watching TV sees someone playing the drums and then falls in love with the drums. And it's yeah. like, you know, people want to see people who they, you know, kind of uh, they uh, recognize or they they feel connected to. So it's it's important. Um, if out of everyone you've had on the show so far, who would you say would be your f let's uh, you can't say favorite. I know because you, you <laughs> who's your who's like your top three or five. You know, who's just some of your most memorable that mean the most to you so far? It is difficult. I looked the one of the coolest things was the when the modern drummer cover came out and I'm like, man, I can die now. That was like pretty oh, bucket totally. list for me with Fred and I doing that. Um, yep. When that came out and they had a section that listed everybody that I've had up until like a time of publication, I was like, you know, the comedy person in me my whole life of like, I don't have much of an ego and I should probably figure that out. That's a smaller meeting of how I fix that and push my own, <laughs> you know, I did this, but like, I, to me, it's not about me. It's, it's about, yeah. again, the community and about, I, I get, I get the experience of being around these people and seeing their talent. And again, like I've said a couple of times, I get to put that talent out there for the community. And the truth of the matter is I wish more people in the community realized that what I was doing is um, for everybody. Um, if I could have one, one, one criticism of her, I think people would think like, why him or why does he decide? I'm just like, I, we're here for everyone. We're yeah. here for drums. It's not about us. It's about the drummers. Like that's what it's about. And then when you see drummers, you see other people playing on their instruments, supporting it, playing actual instruments, which is not exactly something that is on. I, I wouldn't say it's on the up and up, but like more, I think there's more shortcuts to learning and mastering an instrument than ever. Totally. As far as like, it is, it is difficult for me to, to give you favorites. I mean, and I probably could have answered this question better a couple of years ago, but now I've been spoiled with so many players and also becomes about their personalities and just a handful, a small amount of them are actually real friends, you know, like, um, 
we are re- actually like have uh, a connection that goes beyond drums and is more interpersonal and about um, a relationship between two people, which I, I'm always up for that. Uh, and it just doesn't happen a lot in life, I think, for, for most people. But when these guys come and they show up and girls show up, and I'm just like, uh, I'm actually surprised by some of the players that I don't like wasn't fans of, like in the sense I'm like, oh, they're a great player, have money, but I like I don't know their careers as well. And then those people end up we end up being actual friends. But you um, never know. You just don't know. So I mean, like it really is. It really is tough for me to to say. Okay, um, that's it, totally it, fine. You love them all. <laughs> I re- it's not even like in a. It's it's just difficult. Like anyone who comes on, I think in the last few years. And remember, we were kind of like off the air. We we still did pandemic players remotely, which I was very, very proud of that, that we were able yeah. to keep it going and keep the band working. And I missed a lot of those experiences. Like I remember I, I had Mario Duplantier, who is a lovely person and just one of the best to do it um, in, in the metal world and, and as a drummer. And, you know, I didn't, he's, he'll eventually come to the studio, but like to, to actually see that happen and for them to execute so well remotely um and understand the show oh it's like it's that universal thing of like well i guess they don't have to be here to understand what the gig requires because they could yeah. cut, the drummer would record first in the pandemic hearing the scratch tracks of the band and then the band has to play their real tracks over it so it gives the drummer mm. to not have that pressure of getting notes from other players in the room because they're the guests you know technically they actually just have to play but sometimes a lot of them would like put too much in it and then the band would have sure. to like work around the drummer and then I, then I get nervous like well if i bring them into the studio are they gonna be get more in line or are they gonna still try to like be the center of attention whether they realize it or not because they're used to playing all those notes so it's yeah, just so hard to say it's hard to say who's who no but a the lot pan- of those people a lot of the those pandemic people. thing though is super interesting where it's it's like uh i mean that was a weird that's its own whole weird I, we could talk about that for hours, but oh my God, in general, crazy. though, that experience, though, and uh, and overcoming it. I mean, what was the, the initial like trials and tribulations with tech and just oh things like that? And it was that what it was where people would just it was just everyone does their own recording and sets up a camera and and works that way. Yeah, but no one had set up very. How many people had studio setups that were wired for audio and video before the pandemic? No N- now, though, everyone does. It's crazy. They do most most people who, but there's a lot of people who don't need that. I mean, like John Theodore doesn't have that setup. He's one of the most sure. in demand rock players. I don't even think like Matt Cameron, guys like that. You could say like, oh, they're older school guys, but like, there's guys who are older than them who have that st- stuff set up because their business yeah. is more about touring and their reputation's already cemented. And not everyone needs it. Like, it also becomes a thing if you're a touring player. Like when you get home and you're in your home studio you're not there to like just really play for everyone and have them see everything in perfect audio and video. It's, it's not everyone's priority, but like my point that is that sense. before the pandemic, no one, no one had anything. And so we were figuring out with, it was more about me and my editors and, you know, Eli, Jenny, you know, a keyboard and uh, associate MD figuring out how to get the tracks. Um, and these guys who were, didn't have a lot of them didn't most of them didn't have any help because of covid had either go out and buy like a lot of them would go out and like buy their setups or it motivated them hey, if you want to be on the show you need a setup and like well i should probably do this anyway so a lot of people i think now have these setups because i feel i want to feel that i kick-started them to be like you got to figure this out like you know your bass drum's shaking the entire shot so they had to go yes, get stabilizer that's a good call. oh my god and it was like friday and they did it. They would, they would record it an entire day. I go, Hey, don't record, don't record a full day or even like more than a couple of tracks until we hear it. And my editor sees it, Eli sees it and I see it. So we know it's good for air. And some people would just like, I got this. And they were like, all right, here's Monday. <laughs> and they would send all the files and all of it was unusable. Like, and then I'm like oh. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And I go, and they change clothes for each day. They change their backgrounds. And I go, none of this oh, is man. usable because you didn't clear with me first. So there was a lot of frustration. There was a lot, it was, wow. and I was also doing my job of 
trying to get the Zoom set up for the show. No one knew how to use Zoom. No one knew how to get great video and audio for Seth to record guests. Seth was doing his own video and audio. The director was trying to like figure it out. Like we were all getting files uploaded to us to have to cut over some some of them like janky internet connections, badly sounding rooms, ba- badly lit rooms, you know, low res oh, cameras. Yeah. I only have an iPhone, you know, six to shoot this on. So I'm, it's like, uh, okay, well you need something else. Like, well, I yeah. can't afford it. And then I have to like unbook people. Like it was, <laughs> oh, I'm so glad it's over, but I'm so proud of the fact that we kept the band and, and some, you know, as many drummers as I could for those weeks working during a time when no one was working. And um, I'm very appreciative that people pulled, pulled that off my team, um, the band and, and, uh, you know, that we were all able to pull that off together because it could have easily gone. Let's just, let's just, you know, roll old band tracks from the studio with no video over the bump in and outs and not show the band. Yeah. And that would be then when the, that would be then when the rotating drummer program, like, doesn't come back because it's like, well, we're fine now. You know what I mean? You, you, you kept it going and not that it sounds like anyone at late night or like, I can't wait to end this drummer thing, but it's like, but things just like, it's an extra thing to do. Yes. Like, let's say like, you. you, uh, Oh, um, it's a lot of people get that FOMO, you know, when they're like, Oh, I'm going to take vacation. And it's like, Oh, like I have all this vacation time to use. I'm going to take it for a month. And then after a month, people figure out how to do your job without you. Yeah. And I think that is a thing, too, where it's just like, you know, it's easier this way. Let's just do it yeah. that way. It's a, but, like, look, if you took the band out of late night, it's not late night. To me, I mean, you don't have a live, a live band there. Like, it just becomes a different show. It feels To me, it feels much more budget. Uh, and I don't think you're supporting totally. the host as much and, or the genre. And I think, again, kudos to Seth and my boss who are just like, they understand my vision. Fred, of, of course, like, and Fred was, Fred at one point was in London shooting something. And I think it was, I don't think Kaz a- ended up getting it to him, but Kaz Rodriguez was like, if Fred needs an electronic kit because he had his weeks, I could find a way to get him one. And I think Fred ended up renting one, but he mm. set up an electronic kit in his hotel room and did his tracks there while in between like shooting for whatever movie or TV show he was working on. And that's a real testament to him being like, this is going to keep yeah. going. We're going to keep doing it. Yeah. What a pain. Like <laughs> I've been asked to do things like very, very flattered, like even indie drum collective or some charity, but like, Hey, will you record something and play this thing on drums? Everyone's playing this song or do you want to do a cover? And it's not even about like my insecurity is like, I'm not a great player any as good a player as I used to be. Cause I'm just rusty. It's like, I don't want to set up my video and audio and mic everything. And <laughs> it's a pain. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, have, I think I have work. a DTX 10 yeah. Yamaha one that, um, that, uh, I was sent and it's in the box because I'm so lazy that like, I don't, and, <laughs> I don't want to, um, I don't want to set it up anymore. Like I did all that stuff as a kid. I would experiment with mics and rims mounts and different room isolating, you know, you know, totally. stuff on the walls. And now I'm just like, I don't want to do this. So kudos again, to all the drummers and, uh, and the band and Fred who, who kept that going during the pandemic and allowed the band. And, you know, yes, I said, we should keep doing this, but like, ultimately if people didn't want to do it, Hey, that'd be dumb. But like people realize yeah. This, let's keep this thing going. And it's, it was really great to see everyone rallying around once again, drums and music and, and musicianship yeah. for the show. For sure. Yeah. I didn't, it didn't even occur to me the whole keeping drummers with gigs. And I think that's super cool. That That's like a, a very meaningful thing with through the pandemic, getting people jobs. Um, yeah. But, big, big, big deal to me. Very important to keep it going. Awesome, Eric. Well, um, so you yourself though, we've talked a lot about drums and, you know, and, and, you know, what you do with managing the HE band and you, and kind of running the rotating drummer program, but you are a comedy writer. You do a lot more on the show than just the drum stuff. So I'd love as we wrap up here, um, why don't we talk about like that side of it? Like, what do you do as a producer on the show, uh, beyond the drum stuff? I was brought on when the show launched in 2014, I was brought on the end of 2013 to co-run the show as a, as a producer. My background 
before that, like I think my my job before that was running a show called Impractical Jokers. Um, oh, as cool. like the head writer and, and showrunner of that show. And then I also ran another show, Kathy Griffin had a talk show. Um, and I'd done a couple of things at that point, um, that were showrunner level producing jobs. And showrunner, producer, a lot of these titles mean different things at different places, but I've always prided myself as like being a writer who could produce and being a producer who could write. I'm definitely more of a producer than a writer just cause I'm lazy. And ultimately I rather, um, oversee and keep the trains running on time and guide and enhance creative with talent, you know, punching stuff up, making it better. Um, that's kind of my area of expertise and working with talent to, to do that has been my, you know, what I like to say is hopefully my 20 year track record. Um, on late night, I was hired as an, in a non-writing capacity, which is not to say it's not um, creative. It's just, I don't work with the writers or create actual written comedic content for the show but i was hired because i've had the experience of being around those things and knowing with and and knowing like how to be around those people and how to make them better and enhance their creative so i've been doing that i started the daily show in like 99 after college and from there um i worked for like andy dick and i worked in like um the ellen show and i worked for zach galifianakis and i worked for sasha baron cohn David Spade, Wanda Sykes, um, Colin Quinn, like my, I always worked in comedy and I even sold like a game show that I hosted, um, that never went anywhere, but like we had a lot of fun doing it (laughs) and waste spending other people's money. And I like was in commercials and I, I did a lot of stuff in addition to trying to be a professional musician during the majority of that time, because in this world of arts and creativity and everyone thinks it's, you know, you know, it's romantic and fun. It's hard work. And my attitude yep. was to throw everything out there and see what's, what's stuck. And I think getting hired at late night um, was kind of the culmination of all having experience in all those areas and veering more towards a showrunner. And for this job, for late night as a co-showrunner, um, co-producer to, to kind of use all those skills. And um when the band thing happened and the drummer thing happened, as I mentioned earlier, it's about recognizing how to work with talent and my access to all these drummers made perfect sense. But I use all these skills um, every day. And I'll, I'll tell you the back in the day, a lot of agents and managers wouldn't represent me because I wasn't singularly focused enough. They thought I was huh, too, I was too broad. And that's like telling someone now, like who makes their own content, well, I don't know how to edit it. I don't know how to shoot it. I don't know how to host it. Look at you, you know, you're doing every aspect of production to be a, um, a one person machine to execute your product. And I, 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 my only regret in, in my production career is not knowing enough about editing my own stuff and the technical side of it. I know basic stuff. I mean, look, I got, I knew how to get us going in the pandemic and the tools we needed. And, um, we, um, we were mostly successful with that, with keeping the show on the air, and certainly it required a lot of other people and tech to help us get there. But to be an all-in-one writer, producer, talent, and to know how to do all areas of production and bu- the budget, all these things, locations, to to have all the experience I've had and always always firmly staying in comedy um, lets me still do things on the side. Like I definitely need to. You know, I'm working on my own writing right now and, and getting more back into that. And I write scripts for pinball, you know, games for bands. Like Which I've written Rush. Thanks. Well, yeah, I, it's it's such a nerdy, fun thing to do. I'm lucky enough to do it. <laughs> I did Maiden behind me. I did Rush. Um, I can't say the next band I did, but there was a giant rock band I did. It has a machine coming out next year. And an even more Man. giant band that's got a second machine coming out next year that I can't say either. But um. I love being able to do this stuff and it keeps my comedy chops tight. Um, and my, and my late night job, uh, it's just, it really encompasses all creative things I like to do. Um, even if I'm not writing on the show, it burns enough comedy gas and creative gas. You know, it is niche as they get to be in my world. Yeah, and I'm so I mean, grateful to have it really. It's a great gig. <laughs> yeah. That's, it's a, I mean, that's like a, 
I feel like that's something where people don't realize that's a job of writing that the stuff for the pinball machines, but someone has to do it and it takes creative people. Yeah. I mean, I, I, but I say that as an outsider where people talk to me and they go, Oh, how many episodes of a drum history show can you do? And it's like, I, I say 180 and then the list at whatever I'm at now, but it's like people who are outside of that world don't realize the, what goes into each specific hobby kind of uh passion oh of, of yes. everything yeah well that yeah. that's a common misconception too about a podcast is easy acting is easy you know writing is easy because you're in this world that's you're touching talent you know you know yeah. um, not you know figuratively you know in their orbit and i think everyone thinks that's sexy and 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 very cool and a lot of people are like oh my god you met so like so and so is on the show did you meet them and i'm like no not going in and introducing myself in the green room, you know, to, uh, to, you know, I think I did go, uh, introduce myself. I'm like, I need to meet Clinton or I need to, you know, like, yeah. um, or if I know yeah. someone who's on the show, I go in, of course, but you know, I really pride myself in being a behind the scenes person who knows how to act as a behind yep. the scenes person and do that work to support, um, other people who are more talented yeah. than, than myself. And I, I really enjoy that. And I think that is a talent in itself. I don't know uh, if history will remember that. And that's okay. You know, we're here. History needs people to support and to push people um, and artists to keep to keep that stuff in, in, uh, in, in the books. And I think that's really yeah. important. Absolutely. There's a lot of different roles. And I never mentioned this to you, but uh, as a TV guy, I have a background uh, with my last job. But I, I would do uh, work as an ADR recordist on shows I've, i did like arrested development chicago med chicago pd law and order which was i filmed it on like monday and i think it aired on thursday which oh, was wow. insane nice so around. um the deuce which was i was cool to work do adr on a show that i was actually watching and then record uh the dialogue for a show that the season finale aired and i was like i actually like this show and i'm watching it so it was cool to see that but that's, That's my cool. connection to TV, but uh, it's those small little roles that you never, uh, you know, you never know people are there recording, but, but sometimes those sessions would be 10 minutes long and like Dolly Parton's heartstrings, like a little girl would come in and record two words and then leave. And it's like, well, that was a 10 minute session, but you know, it goes on my IMDB. Bill them for the full <laughs> hour, bro. Get them for <laughs> the, get the full hour. hour. Yeah, exactly. I but, think that's um, great. I, I do think um, to be really good at that too. I mean, I have a lot of friends who started early out and, in digital audio in like the late nineties. I have two friends who I met when I went to college, I went to college in Iowa, who were like at the forefront of digital recording and audio. You know, when we were sitting there like with, Oh, you got a jazz disc, you know, like, Whoa, it's a gigabyte on one disc. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and they were recording like, you know, not using tape, you know, not using tape and, and yeah. all the work that went into that. And now the ease of which you can do things, it's still hard. But it's come such a long way in such a short time, and um, to to still to master all these things and to su- to support your artists or yourself and to do it all yourself. There's still very few people who are really good at doing all of it, and I think sure. the idea of you know this jack of all trades sort of sort of gets a bad rap that expression, and you yeah. know ma- you know master of none, and and I'm just like. I don't have time to master one thing and I don't have the attention span to master one thing to master one thing, but I do want to be very good at lots of things to make a, a whole when um, a whole piece of something like when need be. And I think those, yeah, sure. there's more appreciation for those kinds of people nowadays and also an expectation that you have those skill sets. Um, and I try to tell that to young people all the time. of like, well, I just want to do this. And I'm like, yeah, but do it all. Because then Do you're going to you're going to be better. You're going to be more um, appealing to employers or to people who want to work with you when you can pick it up. Yeah. Um, and yeah. also, who's mastering things? <laughs> yeah. You know, like you can't. Ma- it's almost yeah. You can't master it. There's so no. much to learn that if it, it's yeah. yeah. Stop it. Just know. Just know this lots is, of different yeah. things. Exactly. That's that's a good message. Uh, no, you can't master anything. That's what people can take away. That's it. Um, <laughs> Awesome, Eric. Well, this has been incredible. Um, you are just a very cool guy with a very interesting and uh, unique background. And I think, like like I've said, this whole show, you're doing something very cool for the community. 
Um, before we wrap up, is there anything you want to promote? Like tell people, you know, where they can obviously late night with Seth Meyers, is pretty obvious NBC. Check your local listings. You can watch it on Peacock now. Um, follow the show at late night Seth. Follow the H E band, um, at, uh, the H E band. And then follow me at ERX11. And I think the question I get usually after these podcasts, people, a lot of drummers say things like, I don't want to bother him. You can hit me up on my DMs. You should follow the show, the band, me, and don't be afraid to send me your videos of your playing. Um, and if you want to be on the show, hit me up. There's no, if you're a professional and you're out there playing drums and you're gigging and you're working hard, I, I I think people are waiting to be asked and I think some people don't think they're ever going to be asked or people don't think that they're good enough or it's just like, hit me up. This is, you know, this is 2023 people. You can reach out to your heroes, um, you know, favorite bands and drummers and musicians and poets and painters. Everyone's got a way to be reached. And if you want to be on the show, hit me up. There's no guarantees about anything. And I have hundreds of people in the pipeline who I've neglected yeah. just simply because of time and schedule, but please don't be afraid to to hit me up. And I'll, and I always, I always pride myself on trying to read and look at most people. Um, but just send me a message and please, please support local and live music and um, keep buying band merch and going to see shows and supporting all your favorite artists. And, um, and because what they do, it is, it's not free and uh, they need your support. That's the biggest thing I'll, I'll, yep. I'll say about that. And and thanks That's so much awesome. to you for having me and for talking about drums and drummers and um, keeping it niche. I love that because there's so much history that's yet to be uncovered. And, and uh, I'm glad that you're at the forefront of, of navigating that for everybody and bringing it to the masses. I appreciate it, man. And thank you for taking the time on your vacation uh, to, you know, vacation from the show to come and talk to me. And um uh, it'll be out, I think, after it. But happy Hanukkah to you, which is currently oh, happening right now. Oh, my God. As we're it recording. Is <laughs> Mom, I was yep. on a podcast, <laughs> and the host of the podcast reminded me that it's Hanukkah. Let's light the candles now tonight, you know. which we will, 9 o'clock. <laughs> we're going to do it. I appreciate That's that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Absolutely. They, Eric, thank you for being here. Thanks to everyone for listening and supporting the show. And uh, go hit up Eric if you think you are... If you have the chops, uh, so Eric, prepare for a flood of uh, DMs and all that stuff. If you have stuff. the ears, uh, so. Bart. If you have the ears. Have remember, the ears. We, we keep two and four, baby. No, yeah, no chops. No chops. No chops need to fly. Four. All right, Eric, thank you, my friend. Thank you, Bart.